Vladimir Putin's regime has increasingly been accused of embracing fascism in its annexation of Crimea, its historical revisionism, attacks on liberal democratic values, and its support for far-right movements in Europe. These tendencies have accelerated with the full-scale war in Ukraine. So does Russia now meet the diverse criteria for historic fascism or its offshoot German Nazism? Russia has successfully muddied the waters by branding itself as the world's preeminent anti-fascist power because of its sacrifices during the Second World War. But Russia continues to weaponize and debase that legacy of World War II, embracing the same characteristics, policies and tactics as the Axis powers. Welcome to Silicon Curtain. Please like and subscribe and definitely do add comments to the videos. Also, please check out the links we're providing to our guest today, to her books and articles and related materials. And please do also check out the validated Ukrainian charities that appear in the description. Supporting them has never been more important. Marlene Laruel is a research professor of the Illiberalism Studies Department at the Institute for European, Russian and Eurasian Studies at George Washington University. Marlene is a French historian, sociologist and political scientist who specialises in Eurasia and Europe and is one of the most prolific and insightful Western experts on issues related to Russian nationalism and memory politics. Formerly, she was senior research fellow at the Central Asia and Caucasus Institute and, and Caucasus Institute and research fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. So I'm delighted to welcome you to the channel and indeed to discuss this topic, which I think is quite a quite a difficult topic actually to embrace, the idea of whether Russia is fascist or whether it exhibits features of a fascist regime. But welcome to Silicon Curtain. Thank you for the invitation, Jonathan. Uh, so first of all, let's go back to your book in, in 2021. Uh, really, the world had just emerged out of COVID. Uh, Russia was already engaged in its uh, invasion of Ukraine, but not the full scale one. We're talking about the invasion of Donbass and Crimea here. And I think you make the case uh, compellingly that in 2001, that Russia, it's problematic to label it as fully fascistic uh, because it does not meet all of the criteria of that. So let's go back to that argument at that point. Um, do the arguments you think sort of hold up now? And have we significantly moved on from uh, from that discussion? So the discussion is based on kind of two elements. First, how do we want to define fascism based on which criteria? And how do we analyze the Russian regimes, right? And depending on how scholars or experts, experts mix these two uh, uh, levels of analysis, you can answer yes or you can answer no on the question of uh, is Russia fascist? So my approach is, is to say that my definition, the, the definition of fascism that I think makes the most sense is to consider that to be fascist, you need to have an ideology of regeneration through violence. You need to believe that there is a kind of utopian future for your nation where a new humankind will emerge that will be going through violence to kind of uh, be re reborn. And you need this kind of ideology of extreme mobilization. If you don't have this criteria, you can be an authoritarian regime, a dictatorial one, but not necessarily a fascist. So that's the, the criteria I use. And of course, they are pretty kind of, a, if you have a, an extensive definition of fascism, you may kind of a, a, a arrive to a, a different results. And then there is a question of how do we study Russia and at which level do we want to look for that fascism? And here, I think it's also for me, it's important as a specialist of Russia to try to you know, keep the nuances of what we know about Russia, because as external observer, we always tend to look at the most extreme cases, the one that we find shocking, and we forgot. So it's the kind of the 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 sorry, the trees hiding the forest. We don't see all the normality aspect of the Russian society and the Russian regime because that's not the kind of feature that seems to be. Uh, uh, 
the one we want to study. So I always try to be a, a kind of nuance. And so when I wrote the book before the full scale invasion, my conclusion was that the Russian regime is an authoritarian, conservative, on some aspect reactionary uh, um, uh, regimes, but it doesn't fit the definition of fascism because it doesn't have this kind of ideology of regeneration. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist in Russia. It exists in some part, it was existing in some part of the Russian society, especially in all the paramilitary, militia, far-right milieu, which had some connection with the regimes. Of course, it's not people who are disconnected from the regimes, but there was only one layer of the society and the regime. And so my conclusion was that, okay, here you can identify this fascist group, but I wouldn't say the regime is fascist. Now the full-scale invasion arrived, and then the Russian regimes and the Russian society changed a lot. And so my interpretation now is that now you have a kind of dual state in Russia. You have all what we call the Siloviki, so all the security, intelligence services, Ministry of Defense, who really have radicalized a lot, who believe that first through violence, they will get the Ukrainian society transformed, who believe that they can afford a full war with Russia, with, you, with the West, and who believe the Russian society should be mobilized entirely for the war. It means military conscription for everyone, but also, you know, mobilization of culture, of economy. That group of the regime, I think, fit the definition of fascism because they believe in the regeneration for the Ukrainian society and for Russian society, that something new will emerge from violence. But then you still have all this kind of technocratic Russian state, which, which, which we tend not to see but which is functioning in a very normal way and for whom, on the contrary, the special military operation should remain special. There shouldn't be any mobilization. They don't believe in regeneration through violence. They are just trying to do you know, business as usual and trying to keep the special, so-called special military operation on the side. This part of the regime still wants demobilization of the society and doesn't have that kind of radical ideology of regeneration. So for me, they are, you have two identities of the Russian state, right? The regimes are kind of, it's, uh, it's speaking with two voices. One can be defined as close to fascism. The other is not. The other is a more classic demobilizing authoritarian conservative regime. And so we're seeing this struggle and almost a slide towards violence being a solution. And it's interesting, I heard Vladimir uh, Emelenko talking last night about this idea that increasingly, not just to say the sort of core of the Russian regime or the um, Ministry of Defense and so on, I mean, you'd expect them to reach for violence as a solution to various problems. But it seems that violent outcomes are becoming more commonplace and they're creeping into other areas of society. So do you see this as a sliding scale towards violence becoming more endemic in every aspect and every institution of Russian society? Yes, so if we talk about violence, it, it's not violence is not necessarily fascist, right? But you have, of course, because once you have a society at war, I think it's kind of normalized violence on many aspects. You have veterans coming back from the war, you have all this prisoner who are sent to war, who then can get amnestied. So you have a kind of higher level of uh, acceptation by the society of violence. And I think indeed uh, Russia has recorded high, one of its highest level of, you know, criminal violence inside the country. Also domestic violence will be on the right. And I think that trend toward violence will be increasing because Every society with hundreds of thousands of veterans that are men who went through really tough time at the battlefield, come back home with post-traumatic disorder. There is not a lot of, you know, psychological assistance mechanisms in the Russian society to help them cope with that. And we know that once you have been really going through violence, it's very difficult to come back to civilian life. And so in a sense, I think indeed the society itself will more and more become kind of a, a violence because you have this kind of war and post-war phenomenon that we know well in every other societies. And that is a very classic feature of a, a war time and, and post-war time society. And this is where I think we hit one of um, Umberto Eco's definitions of uh, fascism. And of course, 
we're talking here about there being many, many tens of definitions, uh, individual features. Um, um, we probably won't have time to go through all of them. But in this particular one, it's interesting, isn't it? Because not only are veterans returning, often you will have uh, veterans who were released from prison from long sentences or even life sentences for committing heinous acts like murder, rape, uh, theft, you know, extraordinary uh, hardened criminals. They go and they have a very tiny chance of surviving, but some do. Unlike the so-called Morbicure conscripts, they're actually allowed back to their villages, whereas contract soldiers are not. They're not allowed outside of the zone. So first of all, we have this extraordinary uh, preference towards criminality and rewarding criminality. And as you say, they were already damaged. They come back even more kind of damaged. And the lesson they've learned is that there is no legality. But one of the features of fascism is that you idolize war heroes. You, you, you create a narrative where everyone has to be heroic, can't be normal. And it does seem that in certain villages, these people and by extension their families who were outsiders and outcasts have now come back with an aura of legitimacy. They're hailed as heroes, whereas everyone also knows that they are criminals prior to the war and being rewarded for extreme criminal acts in the scope of war. Does 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 that sort of that aspect of it uh, sort of concern you? Because that does feel deeply uh, fascistic. Yeah, well, I would dissociate criminals being rewarded, right, for committing violence in a paralegal framework, which is one feature that I think is indeed a very worrisome one. And then the kind of patriotic celebration of normal uh, uh, veterans, so those who either volunteered or were conscript coming back home, which I find is a more normal feature that we find in many societies going through war, where you come back and you try to celebrate your veterans. I mean, you can think about <laughs> Vietnam's war veterans in the US coming back and not be, being really celebrated at this part of the society. But very often you have a patriotic phenomenon of kind of, you know, defensive uh, uh, cohesion of the society in favor of all these uh, veterans. And indeed, what we seem to see emerging, and I think I think that was very grassroots at the beginning is a kind of process where you also accept as a family member, you know, to take the risk of having your loved one going to the, the battlefield. And if they come back, you have this kind of, you know, patriotic feeling of uh, uh, celebration and pride. And then it got kind of instrumentalized by the regimes when the government understood that you could make that as a tool to invite people to kind of be volunteer. And then you have not only the financial reward, which are really impressive. And I think we really need to realize that if you are an average Russian man coming from rural region, depressed, you know, post-industrial cities, your chances of making such amount of money are zero in your life. So it's a one-time chance, of course, with the risk of dying on the front. But many men are ready to take that chance because even if you die, you know that the prestige and the pride that will come back over your family is, is worth the risk you are taking for your life. So you have the financial aspect. And then the state has been kind of promoting all this kind of celebration and patriotism. And now we really see the narratives coming from the government about the veterans are the new elites. They are the one they will have fast track to enter administration, education system, political life, they have become the new elites because if you went through the war, that's the supreme sign of your loyalty toward the nation. So we see this kind of elite struggle and purges narrative that is emerging and that is, of course, trying to marginalize those part of the elites who didn't want to war and were not very supportive. So we can see very kind of uh, intensive struggles around legitimacy and who is legitimate now to talk in Russia. And I think the veterans are this kind of new elite, or at least they will be presented like that by the, by the, the Kremlin. It's a kind of perverse um, Russian roulette lottery, isn't it? If you if you survive, you win, you know, mini equivalent of the lottery. But it's it's an extraordinary um, death cult, I would say. Um, uh, and 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 we also know that many people in these Russian regions are purposefully kept poor and uneducated because it's easier for the regime to to control them that way. I mean, this is a a theory that goes back, obviously, to to Soviet times as well. Let's tackle the 
I think the really interesting thing you mentioned there, which is that you need to have some kind of um, ideology. You need to have some kind of sense of betterment for it to be truly fascistic. You know, all the suffering, all the dying, all the illegality, it's for a noble cause. Whereas Russia and, and this regime as well is is more known perhaps for its nihilism than or nihilistic mm -hmm. outlook uh, that it is for that sort of uh, broad based um, sort of forward looking idea. Having said that, the regime does seem to be trying to find an ideology uh, which has perhaps brought it closer to those who are on the fringe like Dugin and others who genuinely did not really influence government policy or thinking that much. But now as the regime is rooting around for an idea to justify its violence, it, it does have these. It has um, essentially sort of fascistic ide ideologies inherited from the white emigres. Well, I'll stop talking because you're the expert on this. I'd love to know yeah, the origins of, of um, Russian fascistic thinking and how far that has or has not been embraced by the regime. So I think the regime has been gradually evolving toward a more coherent ideology. So of course, the full-scale invasion is a big step toward that. But I wouldn't say it's a dramatic change, right? All the, There were previous steps that were gradually arriving where we could see the regime's kind of step-by-step -step building a much more coherent narratives or kind of meta narratives about the nation and the future and why do we live and why do we die and so all these steps were kind of they, they evolve with the evolution of the political regime itself and its relationship uh, uh, um, uh, with the west and so one of the impressive ability of the regime is to co-opt a lot of narrative that were coming from different circles of intellectual elites but also from you know pop culture uh, influencer and kind of civil society. And so this regime had the capacity to absorb these different elements and trying to, to stay in tune with the society and trying to make a kind of bricolage kind of ideology of different elements. And then gradually the bricolage became more and more coherent. And of course, with the full-scale invasion and because you have, they feel they need to control better the society and to have better repressive tool and because they need to be able to motivate enough to send men to the front, the coherence elements became really important. And then they really began to kind of build the puzzles in a much more kind of structured uh, um, way. And so gradually over the years, but it already began like 2011, 2012, 2014, a lot of narrative that were very fringe at that time gradually integrated the mainstream. Once they integrate the, the mainstream, they got transformed, right? Because the, the narrative takes some part and abandons some other. So we saw, for example, in the early 2000s, narratives about compatriots were still very marginalized, narrative about, you know, we are divided nations was also belonging to some fridge, and then it gradually become mainstream. And so what we see with the full-scale invasion is that he did some of this narrative that were still clearly identifiable by people who are in this kind of gray area that are not officially government or regime, but who are kind of in orbit around the regime, what I call a, a entrepreneurs of influence, because they are people who try to navigate this gray water and sell their skills are producing ideology, they gradually got better integrated into the, the kind of the mainstream. And we saw that, so Dugin has been one of the very uh, famous, widely discussed case uh, uh, in the West. He was very marginal for a very long time and he's still pretty marginal, much more than we imagine. I'm happy to, to develop on this case. We, but we saw all the figure around him, Alexander Prokhanov and so on, who gradually the ties they had with the regime gradually gave him, them more access. But when you really look at the ideological production made by the regime, for example, all the new textbooks for school and universities, you don't find that kind of radical fringe far-right narrative. You find something that is much more kind of Soviet classic narrative, you know, but the West is bad in the sense it was bad when it was capitalist, now it's bad because it's uh, liberal or postmodern. And so and so, and for example, in all these new textbooks, you don't find any citation of Dugin's, right? He's totally absent of that. 
So there are some elements of these fringe groups getting more recognized and entering the mainstream. And at the same time, the core of the ideological production that is usually textbook for really indoctrination of young people, they remain pretty Soviet and less uh, kind of radical fascist far right as we can imagine. But of course, it's a, it's a balance, right? And the balance can change in the first coming months. The other area where there does seem to be some significant overlap between, you know, Z patriots, the government, and actually, unfortunately, a lot of, I would say, people who are who are not um, particularly, you know, political, who are aligned with extremist ideologies, that is in the othering of Ukrainians. Um, from many correspondents, uh, I hear, you know, stories uh, that even speaking to normal Russians who you can have a conversation with and they may be sort of, you know, they may even be anti-Putin or express views, which are say uh, less so now, but, but, but problematic more because people are you know afraid to speak out. But when you get them onto the subject of Ukraine, there are a set of narratives that are clearly othering narratives, narratives that would have been perfectly comfortable slotted into say a speech by Goebbels talking about, uh, you know, the Jews. Um, the same kind of language and deeply victimizing othering language is applied there. Also, the idea that somehow Ukrainians are Russians that have gone wrong um, and treating Ukrainians as a pathology rather than as people. So why do you think propaganda is so effective in this area? And and um, yeah, I mean, is this one of the either causes of the war or is this something that the government has been very effectively able to manipulate to get people to go along with its war? So here I would dissociate the kind of the official language and especially the television language, so really the core of the propaganda, which is ultra radical and kind of average uh, uh, Russian interpretation. If you look at surveys that are still done in Russia that I think we can still trust even if we have also to take them very carefully because it's a repressive regime at war so the, the the freedom of people to to comment can be can be questioned but when people are asked questions about what they think of Ukrainians they are not really repeating the most radical statement that you will find on television the majority of Russians consider that Ukrainians are victims of course so it's 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 a form of authorization to say that they don't have any agency, that they are just victim of the West trying to instrumentalize them. You only have a minority of Russians who consider that Ukrainians are Russians and that Ukraine should join Russia. That's the minority opinion among the public opinion, which I find interesting because that's the official narrative, but it's not shared. When you ask people, would you like to consider Ukraine should join Russia or stay an independent country, the majority of people will tell you should stay an independent country. Of course, they also mean geopolitically loyal to Russia, obviously, and not joining the West. But the narrative about Ukrainians are just Russians who are ignoring they are Russians, and we need to force them to understand that, is still in the minority in the public opinion. So here you have a, a discrepancy between the state narrative and especially the propaganda television language and the individual perception. That said, the authorization of Ukrainians is going on with this idea that first they have no agency, that it's impossible to have a kind of independent Ukrainian identity that wouldn't be uh, uh, linked to Russia. So, And for me, that I don't read that as a kind of fascism uh, um, element. I read that as a kind of classic feature of post-colonial thinking where it's very difficult for the 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 central the, the colonizing uh, a nation to imagine that all the nations that were at one time under its domination have their local agency their own identity that their identity is as legitimate as your own identity so for me that is typical of this kind of colonial or post colonial contempt that many Russians have toward Ukrainians, toward Caucasian, toward Central Asian, toward their own ethnic minorities. Very typical. But the really fascistic authorization of like Ukrainians are the good to be killed if they don't realize they are Russian, it's not shared by the majority of the public opinion. It's really it's a very small minority of Russian citizens, but it's indeed what you can hear on television. And on that, 
the all the famous Russian talk show on television are indeed super radical and have a narrative of Ukrainian that you can consider mm-hmm. consider as fascist because it's negating identity and it believe that you can change the identity through violence and that for me is a criteria of fascism. And the scale of uh, atrocities, the filtration camps, torture camps, and so on. In your view, does this talk to the idea that uh, Russians who, and here we're not talking about the sort of, you know, the broad population, we're talking about those who are actually, you know, on the front, either in positions of GRU, uh, sort of agents, torturers, soldiers, etc. We're seeing extraordinary atrocities and evidence of atrocities this either would hint at the idea that they think Ukrainians can be converted by violence, or it hints at the idea that they realize that that's not going to happen and that the only alternative is to destroy people because you will never control and coerce them. Um, could you talk around that? Because the evidence of violence is is extreme, um, traumatizing, brutal, uh, and some of the worst examples from human history but which of these two alternative views is more likely to be prevalent well it's probably both in parallel and even maybe sometimes both you know inside the same individual and we know that when you are yourself in the position of committing violence right you can have kind of both vision of both like committing violence because you genuinely believe you can change people's identity or because you know you will not get it, and through violence is the kind of your only resource to convert what you were hoping the population will, will do peacefully, which was originally the state strategies, right? Because that's one of the big mistakes of uh, the Russian regime, is to have believed that because in Ukraine you have people who speak Russian or identify as Russian, they would be happy to join Russia. So they really totally misunderstood Ukrainian, contemporary Ukrainian identity, that you can be Russian-speaking, identifying as Russian, and be a happy citizens of Ukraine. So they totally misunderstood that, and I think they really arrived thinking they would be received, you know, with flowers, and that would be easy, which means they didn't learn the lessons from 2014, where they saw that, except in Crimea and in kind of Donetsk and Lugansk, the rest of the so-called Novorossiya this new Russia, so this kind of eastern and southern territories of Ukraine that Russia was imagining would come back happily, didn't come back happily to Russia in 2014, and they didn't learn that lesson. <laughs> and in 2022, they arrived in Ukraine thinking they would be well received, and then they had to realize that. So I think the violence is also a kind of a, a committed because the, the myth of Ukrainian being happy to become again a, a Russian kind of failed, but in terms of the citizens who are committing or the actors who are committing violence, I think it's usually very complex, you know, interplay of themselves being coerced, right? A lot of soldiers, and we know the Russian army is a very violent army with its own conscript and men. So people are themselves facing violence inside the Russian uh, uh, military uh, administration and themselves pushed to commit violence. So here there are probably a lot of kind of psychological interplay elements that are there and probably probably when we will have later the possibility of, you know, interviewing a Russian soldier and, and, and asking them, there will be very, there will be very complex uh, uh, explanation on why do they commit violence and what did they think about when they were committing violence. Of course, you know, we have the interviews of Vladimir Zolkin, and often he is uh, interviewing soldiers who've actually been either been captured or defected. Um, and of course, many of them will not want to admit to the violent acts that they may have uh, have actually committed. Uh, but as you say, their answers often are quite sort of complex. But the universal response from many of those soldiers is the surprise that they were not treated in the brutalizing fashion uh, that their own army treated them. They expected to be tortured, starved, et cetera. Um, and that didn't happen. I think that that's that's coming through quite clearly from, from those interviews. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I looked at uh, several of these interviews and indeed it's very difficult for Russian prisoners of war to be very explicit about what do they believe when they entered, what do they still believe now, why do they do that, where do, where they thinking they were asked to do, and so on. But indeed, I think the 
what we can see that the level of structural systemic violence inside the Russian military system has been always very high. And so we know the Dead of China and all this uh, different violence committed against conscript. And then the disorganization, because all the violence committed, especially during the first months of the war, so not the kind of occupation of new territories, everyday violence that we have now, but the violence of the conquest of the first months were that people, soldiers were not told what they would have to do and were absolutely not prepared to have that. And let's turn back to, I think, the phrase you mentioned before there, which is post-colonial societies. And I think uh, Timothy Snyder and, and others have talked very eloquently that what European empires required in order to uh, wean them off this sort of behavior and mindset as the imperial uh, aggressor um, was to lose wars and in some cases lose wars catastrophically to, to sort of snap them out of that. I mean, Britain had Suez, France had Algeria. These aren't one-off silver bullet solutions, but it helps towards that transition out of a polished colonial mindset. And Let's face it, you know, that's a process that's still still going on as well. Um, but Russia is very much in that. And, you know, I remember, I, I suspect the attitudes haven't changed hugely since I was there in the 90s. But there was this deep sense of what uh, I would call a um, Pax Sovieticus. Russians then, and I suspect now, believed they were bringing civilization, wealth, and the benefits of, 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 of modernity to all the countries that they had absorbed after the Second World War. The people in those countries would have had a very different conception of that um, and quite possibly would have seen uh, the Soviet uh, Union as limiting their capacity to in innovate, create, you know, comfort, luxury, technology, etc. So you've got this fundamental difference between the attitude of the colonized and the colonizer. We can include all sorts of things in there as well about culture and, and language and so on too. Um, and it seems there is this fundamental problem here. Ukrainians are invaded by Russians and the Russians who arrive are absolutely horrified that Ukrainians live better or seem to live better than, than they do. Um, and yet this idea of the Soviet Union being a beneficial construct to its subjects continues. And Russia seems to want to inherit the mantle of that sort of uh, uh, of that kind of, you know, um, beneficial oppressor. Yes. Yeah, so here also I would bring so kind of nuances in the the level or the definition of what were these kind of colonial feelings. I think there there is a very strong traditional type of Western European type of colonial uh, uh, mindset toward people's nations who are identified as kind of backward in terms of civilization. So classically, you know, colonized people inside Russia themselves, Siberians, North Caucasian, towards Central Asia, toward the Caucasus. So that's one vision where you still have indeed in Russia this vision that, well, we brought them civilization and literacy and culture and industrialization. So that's one vision of nations who would be said kind of Asian, globally speaking. Then you have a vision of the kind of close Slavic people, and that is works for Belarus and Ukraine. A vision, so it's not exactly the same kind of feeling of colonial domination because Belarusian and Ukrainians are considered, or were considered as part of one kind of historical unity of uh, 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 the, the Russian nation. So in that case, it's more a kind of imperial ethno-nationalisms where you consider that, well, they belong to us or they were historically us. So it's not the same kind of colonial concept as for the so-called Asian people. And then you have very traditionally in the Russian vision, the Baltic state and Central Europe, so not include Belarus and Ukraine as being belonging to Central Europe, which were always considered as more developed in terms of civilization because they were always identified as Europeans, including the rich Soviet time, the Balts were considered as Europeans. So here the narrative for justifying domination was more a kind of geopolitical one. Well, we had to rescue them from Nazism or from capitalism 
but there was not the feeling of we brought them civilization because there was this knowledge that okay it's europe it's more civilized than us right so the russians were are putting themselves on a kind of scale of the so called more civilized and less civilized what is interesting is the relationship to ukrainians is indeed super mixed because it's both a kind of imperial feeling ethno nationalism feeling and some kind of colonial element so it has all the aspect and that's why it's so kind of critical it has become such a kind of crystallizing point for the the russian regime and um it's an interesting concept isn't it about uh you know organic culture and and uh it wants to control that it's probably a something we can't get into and it is taking us off off the uh you know the, the the idea of fascism, but one of the definitions of uh, fascistic regimes, and again th there are many, but one of them is that the government and religion are not just closely in, intertwined, but you start to get a kind of merging of the two, and you get persecution of non-state religions. It would seem that this 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 aspect certainly could be applied to Putin's regime. He didn't invent it, of course. Um, when Stalin revised uh, revived the Orthodox Church, uh, it in effect became you know a, a wing of the FSB in terms of the senior sort of hierarchy of the clergy. So how problematic is this idea that religion and government are intertwined? And what can we say about the I would say uh, almost genocidal uh, actions against non-state religions in the occupied territories um, within within Ukraine? Yeah, so I have uh, issues with that definition of uh, um, fascism because for me it's more typical of kind of classic, you know, old-fashioned authoritarian uh, um, regime of having kind of state and state religion kind of merge or put together. If you look at Nazi Germany, they were also very repressive uh, uh, of religions if they were considering religion is not fitting their uh, vision of the of the world, and they had a really tense relation with some Protestant church and with the uh, uh, um, uh, the Vatican. So what I see as an interesting case in Russia, it's how the regimes very early on, right, since even before Putin's arrival in power, since the late Yeltsinian years, created this notion that you have religions in Russia that are traditional, and therefore they are legitimate, and religions that are non-traditional. And this one have the right <laughs> to be repressed. So among the traditional one, of course, the Russian Orthodox Church, Islam in the version accepted and considered as official, Buddhism and Judaism, he also only in some of the kind of official accepted version. So in the contemporary system, these kind of four traditional religion are still very much supported by the regime. Of course, the Russian Orthodox Church is given a kind of symbolic preeminence as the uh, representative of the core of the ethnic Russian nation, but you cannot really say that classic Islamic institutions are repressed into their Russia. They have their room of maneuver and they are also have their right and they, in fact, work very well as kind of junior partner of the Russian Orthodox Church. And then all the religions that are considered as non-traditional, including all those who are mostly considered as foreign religions or foreign proselytizing movement, and that can be both Protestant and uh, Salafist, for example. This one are really uh, largely repressed, uh, Jehovah Witnesses and so on. In the occupied territories, I think the fight that is happening is really around religion. is ultra sensitive because it's a kind of, it's the end of the, the the canonical territories of the Moscow Patriarchate, right? The Moscow Patriarchate had this kind of canonical territory that were bigger than the territories of the Russian Federation because all the kind of post-Soviet Orthodox churches were part of it. And the fact that since 2018, you have an Orthodox, an, an independent uh, Orthodox Church of Ukraine, and that's now the fight is really a good kind of keeping parishes and fighting for the administrative belonging of parishes is kind of also explaining the violence that you see kind of committed in, in occupied territories toward religious feeling. Uh, the, when you follow the Russian news and the, the Russian television, everything related to the treatment of orthodoxy by the Zelensky government is really impressive. It's a big, big issue seen from the Russian side. The fact that the Ukrainian government is trying to push away 
the the Moscow Patriarchate and all those priests who still belongs to to it, it's always presented as really really a big a big geopolitical drama for Russia. So you can see that indeed the regime is super sensitive because it's symbolically considered as a very high uh, um, element of legitimacy for for saying that you know Ukraine should join Russia. And. All these questions come together into, you know, uh, people want to put labels on things. But what we're looking at here is not so much sort of, you know, ideological conformity, but certainly loyalty is critical. Paying tribute to power is political, um, that is, is important. And, you know, not dissenting. So is it is it perhaps more constructive to think about the Russian regime as showing classic signs of a mafia organization as opposed to classic fascism well i think i mean i, I will come back on the, the the mafia question i think it's showing the classic sign of an authoritarian regime where you believe that citizens should demonstrate what you need is citizens to demonstrate loyalty in the public space you are not really trying to change what they think really deep in their mind, because in a sense, you don't care. It's as long as they are publicly demonstrating loyalty, because when they demonstrate that, those who are in a dissenting mood have no clue if they are alone or if everybody is thinking like them. So that allows you not to be not to have to organize mass repression because people self-censor themselves. Because if everybody's showing sign of loyalty, they may be criticizing the regime in their kitchen, but you don't know until you are with them in their kitchen. So people are kind of losing touch and cannot measure if their perspective and being critical of the regime, if they are alone thinking that, or if almost everybody is thinking that, but nobody is saying that. So it's a way to avoid a kind of mass repression and mass repressive apparatus that the regime is uh, trying to avoid to, to put in a, into into mechanism because they know it's costly and then they know you also have to repress your own elites and that is also problematic for the regime. That said, the parallel between the, the, the Russian regime as it has been built and mafia has been very well studied by several uh, 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 Russia experts like Mark Galeotti and indeed because the, the way the regime emerged in the 90s when the Soviet Union collapsed and you had this kind of super violent and rapid transformation and market economy arrival, it had both the criminal world and the kind of market neoliberal world kind of merge in one with a very strong uh, uh, element uh, uh, still controlled by the security services. And we know that for years, Putin himself has been very often playing a kind of aesthetical uh, a role that is also close to the kind of the mafia uh, a leader or the godfather or a lot of kind of symbolic element of you know street culture and mafia culture have been integrated into the Russian uh, 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 mainstream very early on so you have this kind of yeah mafia or gang street gang uh, uh, culture that has been part of the kind of aesthetization of the regime but for me that is a typical product from the 90s and the way the societies got transformed and the way the regime was built over these different kind of uh, criminalized element of the, 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 the Russian societies of the 90s. So I don't parallel, you know, fascism and the mafia aspect. I think it's really specific to the way the, the, the political regime was built in the 90s. And another another definition of um, classic fascist state is a union between the state and corporate power, a kind of alliance of, of commonality there. But of course, that is based on the idea that in Italy and Germany that arose in mature capitalistic societies with well-developed middle class, well-developed corporate power, um, industrialism and so on. Is Russia a slightly different case? Because here we see extreme cronyism, which actually is undermining capitalism. And in fact, you know, speaking to some Russians now, they're suggesting that whatever economic advances were made, especially up until Bolotno in 2012, that you're seeing a rapid disintegration or return not just to nepotism, but to the outright, you know, gangster tactics of the 90s, where people will throw money at uh, some apparatchiks, they'll be assigned somebody's business, you know, hostile takeover Russian style. So you're seeing a, a degradation where loyalty 
um, is is rewarded over competency and where rampant nepotism and corruption threatened to, to tear apart what little productive elements of the state left. In this, in your view, does that is that where Russia diverges again from, let's say, how the uh, Nazi regime operated or Mussolini's regime? Yeah, I think it's a difference also because so in the 2000 and 2010, the collision, because you had a strong kind of overlap between state interest and big kind of corporation, both public and private, was based on one that was the kind of also the legacy of the 90s, which was like oligarchs need to be controlled politically and need to show loyalty to keep their commercial empire uh, accepted and validated by the regime. And the second one was the kind of state develop developmentalism that is much more typical of kind of BRICS uh, uh, countries or arriving uh, uh, regional power that were showing how much Russia was late or not in line with the kind of traditional, well-established old uh, uh, capitalist market was still in this idea that the state has to play a critical role in kind of pushing the market economy with some limitation uh, uh, in what the, the, the market should be. What we see since uh, the full-scale invasion of Ukraine is indeed a comeback to some of features of the 90s that is for very long the Putin's regime never challenged the privatization that were done in the 90s, except when it was oligarchs who had a kind of political uh, 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 strategy, and in that case they were stopped. But they were not challenging the, the idea itself of the privatization of the 90s, which seems is becoming to be more visible now where they are kind of coming back on privatization for reasons that are not strategic interests. So it's not kind of counter sanction, you know, retaliation measure. They are going after some Russian businesses, so there is no Western, Western partner or whatever, and kind of readjusting or redistributing the assets. And I think that's also that's pretty typical of a war economy. If you have to keep your country in a war economy enough to continue the war, and then continuing the war is your main criteria, not kind of, you know, neoliberal market aspect. The war is the final goal, not having a prosperous uh, uh, capitalist economy. Then in that case, it makes sense to use economic assets to redistribute legitimacy and power between the different groups. And so I think that what is happening now is that a lot of assets redistribution is going on in the name of the war, but in fact, it's just a readjustment of the, the, the regimes to the kind of subtle change in power that we as external observer cannot necessarily identify, but there are a lot of fights going on between different groups inside the regimes. And so assets are kind of distributed now and privatization seems to be getting more and more challenged. And, they, and that also goes well with the mood of the public opinion because the public opinion has always been super critical of the privatization of the 90s. So when the regime is saying we are going after oligarchs who left, we are taking over this kind of you know, wrongly uh, done deals in the 90s. The public opinion is all for. The public opinion on that is largely leftist in its view of the economy and believe the state should nationalize and kind of uh, renationalize a large part, at least of the big, not of everyday life, you know, small businesses, but of big businesses. So the regime can do that with a large public opinion support. Of course, they're they're spinning it politically, and and they're, what they're rewarding is uh, loyalty over competency. That's going to have a dire long term effect on the economy. But as you say, the contingency of a war economy. Well, let's let's tackle one or two more uh, of the classic definitions of fascism um, before our time runs out. One of these, of course, is militaristic, nationalistic indoctrination of children and as you said the history textbooks have recently been changed um a lot more historical mythology is in there uh, a lot less uh i would say sort of balanced view of the former uh colonial parts of the uh, colonized parts of the russian empire and of course um you know passing over some of the worst aspects uh, not just of imperial russia but also of course of the soviet union a lot of those crimes are played down as well 
Do you feel that the encroaching uh, indoctrination uh, in the education system of the younger generation is is that moving towards uh, a sort of more fascistic uh, sort of style? Ian Garner, of course, has, has written about that and the symbolism of the Z and so on, the the paramilitary uniforms a lot of children are pictured in would suggest superficially that it's moving in that direction. But I'm interested in, in what you think. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, in my book, in so before the full scale invasion, the book of 2021, I was already saying, so this kind of paramilitarization of the society is for me the key element that would uh, 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 that would define uh, uh, Russia as becoming uh, uh, fascist. And I think that indeed what we see now is a move in that direction with a really increased paramilitarization of patriotic education. So it's not only asking children to be proud of being Russian and of the state and of Vladimir Putin is also militarizing their everyday activities, their leisure time, their vacation time. And so he also, it's it, it's socially or sociologically very interesting to see that if you are children of the elites, of the, 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 the urban, middle and upper classes, you can avoid that. But if you are children of an average Russian family in provincial Russia, then very much your leisure time at school will be now oriented toward this kind of military patriotic education. And that may have an impact on the long run, of course, of the the political direction of this uh, young new generation. So yeah, that's a key element the militarization, but it's not only the indoctrination aspect, it's the militariz- militarization aspect of uh, of everyday life and of leisure time of children and teenagers that I think is very, indeed, uh, uh, very problematic. The textbook themselves, it's interesting because what where they have been the most transformed, it's really in rehabilitating Soviet Union and kind of Soviet vision of the world order, Soviet vision of the United States and the West. So it's a very much a kind of what we call a retrotopia. So you project in the future, <laughs> the past, and the Soviet past is the main kind of a past to be projected. So for me, that's in the textbook, that's the most visible aspect. And the most worrisome is indeed this kind of militarization of use. And that's an interesting comparison, isn't it? Because for... Classic fascism, the purity is in the future. The utopia that you're committing all these barbarous acts for is 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 held out to be somewhere. Whereas it seems that the the, the Russian way, very much in contrast to Ukraine, Ukrainians seem to me to be very forward looking, very sort of progressive in their ideas. Um, they're working towards something that hasn't yet happened. Whereas in Russia, it's the sense of a lost utopia. The perfection is always in the past, and you're trying to somehow purify the present to get back to something that's lost. Is that a different form of fascism, or is that something else? And how does it tie in to really the last area I want to look at, which is the idea of the cult of tradition? Because this is one area where certainly the regime seems to make a lot of use of that. It talks about traditional lifestyles. It talks about uh, morality. Um, obviously, there is uh, suppression, condemnation of uh, LGBTQ, etc., and and they use that as well to um, help fire up, you know, assets and agents abroad and various extreme uh, extreme movements uh, that uh, that they think are going to destabilize their enemies. So, where do we sit in this whole idea of cultural tradition and you know future utopia versus lost utopia? Yeah, I think for me, that's a key criteria and that the criteria that dissociate a reactionary ideology from a fascistic one. The fascistic is turned toward the future. The fascistic is optimistic <laughs> in a sense to what, what will emerge. The reactionary one is turned toward the past and is pessimistic. They know the past is lost, that we are just trying to get it back, but we know deeply that it's lost. And I think that's the Russian perception. It's a reactionary, it was conservative, it's becoming more reactionary now. It's not fascistic because it doesn't have this projection of the future. It's looking back because the past, the the good time, the golden age is past. And so we are just trying to cope with that kind of lost uh, um, utopia. So that's why for me on that, it's a reaction. And of course, I mean, there is a continuum between reactionary and fascist. You may have, if you look historically, you may have people of movement who move from one to the other. But so far for me, the regime is in a more kind of reactionary uh, 
ideological dimension than a fascistic one, precisely because it's looking toward the past and not toward the future. And the last question, and this is this is probably an impossible one to ask. Uh, you, you probably won't uh, won't be grateful for this one. Is it easier? Uh, none of this is easy, of course. Is it easier to evolve into a progressive democracy coming from being a fascist in an ideological stance? Or is it more difficult coming from the place Russia is currently? We saw Spain you know, emerge from Franco's uh, regime after decades to become a vibrant uh, democracy where you know, ideas and innovation are celebrated as well as you know certain you know traditions preserved and protected is russia in a more difficult position in some way to emerge from its current um less well defined sort of ideological uh concrete that's barely you know holding the regime and the country together no, in fact, I like the the parallel and the comparison with post-Franco Spain, because for me, you know, there have been a lot of comparison between uh, Germany at the end of the Second World War and Russia, as if, and for me, it's the comparison doesn't really work because Germany was an exceptional case of a, a, a fascist regime being defeated entirely by war, being occupied, and the society is being deeply and very rapidly uh, kind of transform. And I don't think that scenario will happen to Russia. And I think the Spanish case is more interesting where you have a kind of transformation from the inside of the regime at the death of the, the leader. And then a kind of the memory work and the move toward the democratic system don't go at the same path, right? Spain became a democracy while it was still very ambiguous on the Francoist uh, uh, path, and it took decades to make the memory work. And I really believe it will take decades for Russia to make all the memory work they have to do on the Soviet past and on the, 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 the post-Soviet past. But I think politically, it could be evolving uh, uh, much faster than the memory work could be could be doing. One of the big difference, of course, is that Spain was able to join the European Union and could reinvent itself with the European future, which Russia will not be able to do. So the fact of being a great power or imagining yourself as a great power and being on your own as a state, right? There is no strategies and there will be no strategy of joining the EU, make the transformation much more uh, uh, difficult for Russia. And at the beginning of the war, I mean, in July, in the summer of 2022, there was a great focus groups done in several Russian cities where people were asked, how do you imagine your future in 10 or 15 years? And the majority of Russians were, were describing a future that looked a very European one, you know, good quality of life, respect for individual rights, more or less democracy with some nuances, but great power, right? And that's where the day the regime will change, they will have to reinvent what it means to be a great power, right? How to be a great power, I don't know, by, by your culture, by your territory, by you know your your nature your wilderness but not by military uh, means on that there will be a, a lot of work to be done but but i think we should be looking at it at countries for whom the transition toward democracy was long slow complex not obvious with ambiguities i think that's what we will get in russia there won't be any kind of you know one day it was black and the next morning they wake up and then they were <laughs> ready for for kind of a, a liberal democratic way of, uh, of imagining their future also I have to say Europe is changing itself, right? So it's much more difficult today, except for the very specific case of Ukrainians, because they are fighting for something they 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 really uh, need to to imagine. But the fact that Europe is itself doubtful about its kind of liberal democratic commitment will means also that countries around will become much more doubtful also, right? So we are no more in the kind of perestroika time where Soviet citizens were looking toward the West and think, thinking the West is great and that's the solution. I think no, everybody now realize, well, maybe Europe is not so, it's not so easy neither in Europe. And that is kind of slowing down the capacity of the society to accept transformation for a good cause. That's why I'm hoping, you know, Ukrainians understand the difference between freedom and non-freedom. They understand that language, culture, 
the ability to create businesses, wealth, comfort, everything stems from those fundamental values. I hope very much Ukraine can reinvigorate our democracies and, as you say, our belief in democracy rather than the sort of nihilistic doubts because, uh, you know, when you're on the edge of freedom as Ukraine is, I think you understand what that means. And when it's not under threat, it's more difficult to, to visualise and imagine that. This has been deeply fascinating. I know I didn't cover off all of the classic points, but I think we covered off many, many of the uh, classic definitions of fascism. Um, we're going to put some links into the video, including to your books and potential further reading. I think this is, is, is a deeply nuanced and important conversation. So thank you so much for sharing your time with the channel. Well, thank you so much for the invitation, Jonathan. It was great.